Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Keili'i Aquino, your host and the president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, here in Hawaii, we've got beautiful weather, lovely skies, ocean, mountains, and wonderful people. But do we have all the liberty that we need? One thing's for sure, we live in an economy. What's the relationship between economics and liberty? Well, today I'm going to ask my guest that because he knows all about it. He's an associate professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University. But more than that, he travels the wor world spreading the message of liberty. One of his books, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, has been translated into dozens of languages and has become a text for anybody who's interested in free market economics. My guest is also a dear friend of mine, one of my closest intellectual companions, someone I've known for many decades, and I'm delighted to have him on the show again. Professor Ken Scullin. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kali. You make my job easy because I try to make my guests look good, but you're already good. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much we for having me. We go back several years together. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, and I think what draws us together is a love of rigorous thinking and applying that to the real world. <laughs> well, oh, that, that is a challenge, then, isn't it? <laughs> well, you do a great job. Now, how's Jonathan Gullible, the subject of your most famous book, doing? Well, uh, the adventures of Jonathan Gullible started in Hawaii. Uh, nearby here, it was, uh, started off as radio commentary on local issues. And uh, since then, it was published as a book by Sam Sloan at Small Business Hawaii. And then it uh, took off internationally. Uh, it's now in, uh, published in 80 editions in more than 50 languages uh, worldwide. Well, we've it's got been, copies of Jonathan Gullible mm -hmm. in front of us over here. And I just wanted to ask you if you would just very concisely Tell our viewing audience what the essence of Jonathan Gullible is. Well, it's a, it's a tale along the lines of Gulliver's Travels and The Little Prince, uh, where Jonathan simply asks questions of people about their strange and bizarre behavior. And this happens to do with public policy often. And it uh, uses uh, humor and satire uh, to poke fun at a lot of the ways that uh, public policy is established and maybe does unintended consequences for people. Now you've got this fanciful character, Jonathan Gullible, just traveling around in this island paradise, observing different things in a pre-technological uh, industrial environment. And yet, it, many of the things he observes seem to strike home here in Hawaii. Very much so. And uh, I, it's funny because when, when it was uh, published in Poland, uh, someone said, well, how long were you living in Poland that you understood all the issues that we seem to be having here? And I said, well, I didn't originally write it about Poland. I was writing it about Hawaii. But it seems to strike a chord in people almost all around the world. You've even yeah. been credited of bringing about or, or accused of bringing about the uh, uh, revolutions we've seen in the <laughs> Mideast. Well, the, the, the Arabic edition had been published just at the time of Arab, Arab Spring, Spring, so I do like to take credit for all of the positives of Arab Spring. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I want to talk with you today a bit about the relationship between economics and liberty. And before we dive into that, though, let's go to the newspapers and look at some of the things taking place. Right now, our government is considering another hike in the general excise tax. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, it's being talked about as something very sympathetic, something that we all care about, which is the need to help our teachers to get higher salaries, the need to educate our keiki, our children more. But really behind it is a mechanism that may or may not work. What do you think about hiking the GE tax in order to provide for education? Well, politicians always offer solutions to problems that increase their power and never ones that decrease their power. And I would say that uh, instead of making the cost of living so high for everybody, which is what the general excise tax does. It's really a, a almost 11 to 12 percent increase in the tax that, uh, that they're imposing on food, clothing, shelter, everything at every stage of, of distribution. Well, let me stop you there and pick mm -hmm. apart what you said. 11 to 12 percent increase. I'm mm -hmm. not hearing that from the politicians. I'm no, not hearing that from those who are promoting the bill. I'm hearing it's merely a half percent increase in the 425 on the Lulu uh, general excise tax. I know it's only 4% on the neighbor islands, but I'm hearing it's only half, half a percent, a percent yeah. and we'd hardly notice it. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, it's actually, if it's half a percentage on 4.25%, uh, that's actually a, a 11 to 12% increase. Oh, know? so nobody's going around <laughs> as in truth in lending telling us we're really talking about a 12% increase in the general excise tax. That's right. And, and because it's at every stage of the distribution, 
it works out something that, that would be comparable on the mainland to, I don't know, anywhere from 13 to 15% to uh, sales tax in other states. And that's, that's a huge amount of, of uh, tax that everybody is paying, and it uh, comes uh, as a regressive tax. It comes as a higher percentage of the income of every low-income wage earner in the, in the state here. Which when you is, say regressive, you're talking about its impact upon those who can least afford it. Yeah. In mm -hmm. other words, the ones who actually have fewer options for their tax strategies or for purchasing their goods and so forth, they're not just paying 4.25%. How does it work when you say it's regressive? Well, because the general excise tax is at every stage of distribution, uh, wholesale mm -hmm. and manufacturing, wholesale distribution and retail. So it's a tax upon a tax upon a tax, and, and it uh, becomes uh, much more of an ultimate tax, and it's largely invisible. That's why politicians can so easily get away with it. They don't, uh, people don't often see it. They see it as the, the increase in prices of things. They don't see that so much of it is the taxes is at every stage of distribution. And you know that researchers have shown that for those who can least afford it, sometimes they're going to be paying 13 to 18 to 20 percent of their income on general excise tax overall. If they stay in Hawaii, I mean, Considering the high cost of, of living, which everybody acknowledges, um, people just pick up and move. They say, well, we can't afford it here. And businesses, they shut down and move to other places that are low cost. And so employment is, is, uh, moves as well. And, and a lot of people, young people, when they graduate from school here, say, we can't, we can't afford to live, live here, so we'll move somewhere else. And, Sad to say, you sound like a cartoon that Grassroot Institute published <laughs> just this week on a new strategy for dealing with the high cost of living in Hawaii. <laughs> Move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ouch. Right. But that's yeah. happening to so many people right now. That's right. We have that's one right. of the highest per capita rates of residents actually leaving the islands. Mm -hmm. And it's largely because of the cost of living. And it would be so much easier if the state really wanted to, to figure out how to, weigh, how to be more efficient and productive with their expenditures rather than just increasing the tax. Now, the, the education uh, that this is supposed to be paying for um, I would think that a lot more efficient ways could be used on, on how to, uh, uh, to spend the education dollar than, uh, than just raising the tax. Well, you're raising an important issue here. You're questioning whether we actually need to take tax dollars and give more money to education. You're saying perhaps we should actually use the tax dollars that are there already in a more efficient and effective manner. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that, would, that applies to everything that the government does. And they have a little incentive in the private sector. They have very strong incentive to keep their costs uh, down as well as, their, you know, as to improve the efficiency and productivity of their performance. But politicians don't have that same sort of thing. They, by law, by, by writing the law, they say, well, our salary is this, and you have to pay it because uh, the force of the state is behind it, regardless of whether or not we're productive or efficient. Um, you know, in, in, in our performance. Well, once again, before we get to our topic of <laughs> liberty and economics, let's pick a, something else for, in the news. Uh, we're also looking at potential increase of the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Now, on the surface, just like helping <clears throat> teachers and helping our keiki through a, an increase in general excise tax, on the surface, raising the minimum wage sounds like it's good because it's helping <clears throat> those people who make the lowest amount of money to get more money. Now, ostensibly, that's its purpose. But you don't think that it actually is going to end up accomplishing that, do you? Well, it actually, it'll hurt uh, the, the people at the lowest rungs of the economic ladder. They're on a, on a career ladder, and you're basically removing the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. You, you're not allowed to be paid to learn on the job, to get, to get the training on the job. Uh, and those bottom rungs of the economic ladder are removed, and you have to somehow get the skills maybe from a school that may or may not appropriately train you for higher rungs on the economic ladder. You're and, suggesting uh, that those who actually go for minimum wage jobs are people who are climbing a ladder mm -hmm. and that that's the doorway in for them. The, minimum, the lower the wage, the easier it is for businesses to give a job mm -hmm. and people who go into those jobs like teenagers and those without skills are trying to acquire skills, and they'll move up the ladder naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's where the best training is, and it's for the job. Um, whereas a school that you have to pay for, you, you're just hoping that the training you're getting there will 
be appropriate to the job you want, but look at the government's record on it. After 12 years of, of education in government schools, a lot of students just don't have the skills for, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the job that they're looking for. Or then they go on to university and then they graduate and they say, well, where's my job? Maybe I don't find it here in Hawaii. Well, you've studied the minimum wage laws and you've written many articles on it. How does the minimum wage increase mandated by the government affect small businesses, the very employers of people? Well, employers, uh, if they find that their costs suddenly go up, um, <clears throat> they might, because they're going to have to pay more for labor, and they're going to have to pass that along to their customers. The customers may not buy, pay the higher price, so they've got to figure out a way, well, uh, what do I do? I've got to, I, I can uh, pay fewer employees, so I have to lay off the least skilled or the least trained or the least uh, um, valuable workers uh, so that I can pay the remaining ones higher. And if that doesn't work, I close up shop and I move abroad. Or I might automate. And that's why, you know, when you and I were kids, uh, we used to go to the gas station and there was always someone who would fill our gas tank and take our credit card and uh, fill the air in our tires and wash the windows, check the oil, do all that sort of stuff as service uh, to us. But that's all been replaced by self-service uh, machines, okay? So all that employment is gone because it's too costly to hire somebody to do that. And, and minimum uh, wage will make it even more costly to hire people. If politicians point. could determine the value of a worker just simply by passing a law, then why stop there? Why not $100 an hour? Now, let me clarify something. While you may be uh, not in favor of the government imposing a minimum wage, mm -hmm. you are in favor of people making more money. Oh, yeah, absolutely, sure. Well, then what's the solution? If, if we don't want government to be the ones to force businesses to pay a certain level, how do we have an economy in which wages are growing? Well, you notice uh, that 97% of all the employees in the workforce are getting paid above the minimum wage. So and something employer... in the economy is working already. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're paid for what the, the value is to, to the employer. They're, no one tells them they have to pay them more than the minimum wage, but most employment all is. They pay them when it's worth it to the, uh, to the employer to employ them. A lot of people think if you ended the minimum wage, well, then employers would, would not pay anything. Uh, but the fact is, they, they pay them for what they're worth. These are, this is voluntary behavior between consenting adults. And politicians are basically... Uh, in a paternalistic manner, intervening and saying, well, we don't, you're too stupid to make judgments uh, of this kind for yourself. Now, another thing, um, they mostly kind of applaud voluntary uh, action, uh, internships and voluntary uh, work where you get paid nothing. Um, and people do that because they're trying to get the experience in the marketplace. The experience is extremely valuable to people to be able to uh, uh, pursue the career that they really want and the kind of work that they want. And it, it, voluntary work uh, and internships are, seems, seem to be uh, applauded. But if you get a dollar more than nothing, then suddenly it's illegal. You're considered to be uh, uh, exploited and, and, uh, and, and undesired. <laughs> well, it's counterintuitive. When we come back from a break, we're going to talk about the relationship between liberty and economics. But before we go into it, how does raising the minimum wage and uh, Additionally, forcing businesses to have a, I mean, in addition to that, uh, raising the GE tax, how do those things mm. affect our liberty? Well, the government raises the cost of things. Why wasn't the last minimum wage adequate for today? Because the prices of everything went up. They went up because the national government has a monetary policy of creating trillions of dollars additional money and the local government uh, raises enormous taxes. So this raises the cost of everything. That's why this is, this is a, uh, a wage reduction for all of the low-wage workers when their prices go up. And yet the government causes that. And yet, on the one hand, they, while they create the problem, they then presume to be the solution to that problem by saying, OK, now we're going to demand that everybody pay you more to cover the things that we've made more expensive. Well, we'll come back after a quick break. And when we do, I'm going to ask Ken to talk about one more thing which is going on, the creation of a situation where our government will become a major landlord, providing leases for 99 years for a large number of Hawaii residents. And then we'll pull it all together and say, how do all of these things affect our liberties? And what's the relationship between economic freedom and our liberties? Mm -hmm. I'm Kili'i Akina with Ken Skolan. We'll be right back on Think Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Don't go away. Mm -hmm. 
Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming Salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Thanks for not going away. I'm Kili'i Akina. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My guest is Professor Ken Scullin, the author of The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible. And we're talking about the relationship between economics and individual liberty. And in the news currently is a proposal by some of our state legislators for the government to become a massive landlord, to take mm -hmm. public lands, build tall buildings in the urban core, and lease out tiny apartments costing about $300,000 each, they say, to people for 99 years. And if this project goes forward, the government is involved in another massive public works program, it, on the surface, is receiving a lot of good play because people say, we need roofs over our heads. Mm -hmm. And therefore, here's a solution to the housing crisis in Honolulu. What are your thoughts about that? Does this make us any more free or does this impinge upon our freedom? Well, this uh, just reminds me of a, an old quip by uh, L. Neal Smith. The government is, behaves like a disease masquerading as its own cure. Uh, why is there a shortage of housing in the, in the islands? Well, for one thing, the land area that's allocated for all residential and commercial use is very, very strictly limited to very little, maybe 5 to 6 percent of all the land uh, in, in the islands. In other words, you're saying that 95 percent approximately of all the land in the islands is not being developed. It's either dedicated to agriculture, which we know most of it is not being used, mm -hmm. or it's preservation land. So yeah, we're was, talking about only 5 percent to 6 percent uh, actual usage of land. And it was intended as a no-growth policy, you know, but, on, but by doing that, the, the growth then comes in the prices of things. The price of everything goes up. And then secondly, they've outlawed bringing in the lowest cost of uh, modular homes, uh, prefab homes that were produced on the mainland. We, we call them uh, mobile homes or trailer park, uh, trailers that, that could come in at not $300,000 for a, 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 a little tiny condo, but for a double-wide uh, expansive uh, building that would be very, very comfortable living for maybe $50,000 or less if you had a place to put it. And, but these things aren't allowed because it threatens uh, you know, the labor and construction market. Um, if these things were simply allowed, you'd have a lot more affordable, low-cost, very low-cost homes that people could do in the marketplace without government partnerships. Now, I'm always very, very skeptical of government-private partnerships where, in fact, it's the government with political insiders, cronies, friends of friends who have special deals, and you can see what, the, what that's turning into with the railroad. You know, it's a public-private partnership um, to, to build a, a railroad that has gone up uh, in price so much and uh, delayed so much. It's a massive uh, white elephant, and, and it's, cost, it's going to cost people enormously. And there again, they've provided uh, a solution, a government solution to transportation. They actually drove out of business. The, uh, the railroad was here that, that existed here in the islands a long time ago by having the government build the, uh, the highways and roads that they do. Now they're putting in a, another railroad 20 miles for $10 billion or so. And um, I think that the better solution would have been uh, just allow competition with the bus. Back in 1940, they outlawed, the Public Utilities Commission outlawed all competition with the bus, put out of business all the competitors that were providing better service, better rates, better um, uh, routes and, and uh, times and hours. Uh, they were highly favored by the public, but the Public Utilities Commission said, no, 
And so for 80, 80 years, we've had almost no competition with the bus. So we're talking about two issues now. You're talking about the rail and the course it has taken in order to explain your uncomfortability with the governor, government becoming a landlord. And, and, and what, what is your thought about that? In fact, many people actually speak as if it's a virtue. They say Singapore is a place that has no housing problem because the government is the landlord for about 75% of the population. Why not be Singapore? What are your thoughts? I'm not all that familiar with Singapore, but I do know that it's virtually impossible to say anything against the, uh, the one party that, that rules and dominates there. I've, uh, the newspapers don't criticize it, and, there, and other political parties aren't allowed to criticize it. Um, and, and frankly, I, I think any kind of system that, that doesn't allow uh, that kind of challenge uh, to the political and media uh, uh, of, a, of a society is questionable. I don't really trust the things that, uh, that one can say about it. But do you think that people really value that uh, freedom to be able to speak out against your government or be able to dissent? What about people who say, or I don't know if they are saying this, but are people, do you think people by their very nature feel, gee, I don't have a roof over my head and I would love to be living somewhere even if it was the government that was my landlord? Um, Friedrich Hayek wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom, in which he are, are told about the relationship between one's economic life and one's personal freedoms. And the more and more of economic life you give over to the government to control and run and operate for your supposed benefit, the more you're going to lose your ultimate uh, right to run everything about your life. And I mean, I, you think back to the reason that the Founding Fathers sought uh, freedom and liberty um, wasn't just to have a roof over their heads, they sacrificed the, the, um, the immediate things in order to have that, that freedom. It's kind of like air, so to speak. <laughs> you, you breathe air, you take it for granted, it's invisible, you don't realize it's there. You feel as though you're paying nothing for it and you don't value it until the gone. day <laughs> you don't have air. And yeah, then yeah. all of a sudden you realize what the loss of freedom is. Now you look uh, at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, uh, which is produced by the Fraser Institute. That's right shows all the, uh, the openness to, to the markets. And you find that actually Hong Kong and Singapore, though they don't have democratic and political freedoms like we might appreciate here, they actually have much more economic freedom, low taxes, low regulation, and much more economic freedom than we have in the United States and in most of the countries of the well, world. That, that's an interesting point. So then when people are making a comparison between Hawaii and Singapore and saying, well, letting the governor be, government become a landlord is just making us more like Singapore. There's quite a bit of difference in the two economies because, as you pointed out, Singapore is highly ranked amongst nations in terms of economic freedom, whereas Hawaii, amongst states, is very poorly ranked, very poorly. somewhere it's in the mid-40s yeah, right, right. in terms of economic freedom. And mm -hmm. what are the elements that you would consider as part of economic freedom? Uh, the five con conditions they consider are uh, the, the measure of uh, uh, government spending and taxation, uh, the openness to trade, the sta stability of their money, the security of property rights and contracts, and uh, the degrees of regulation. And when just not going through all five of those, just starting with the very first, government spending and taxation, yeah. Hawaii is not d near the bottom in terms of economic freedom. Because that's of right, that. that's right. So and, uh, turning mm -hmm. the government, er, government into a major landlord for so many in the population would actually worsen our standing in terms of government spending and taxation. Yeah, the government can do a lot because it depends on a free market to produce the goods and services and the wealth uh, to make them make it possible for them to take junk and, and spend it the way they want to. But you've got to allow the degree of freedom for people to pursue their own ends, their own economic wealth. Um, so while Singapore may have a high measure of that free market, we don't in Hawaii. Yeah. How would the free market or how would a growth of free market in Hawaii actually help us resolve some of the problems we were talking about, such as the cost of living and education and transportation options. What if we were to leave more to market forces? How would that look? I think it would, uh, first of all, it would end the Jones Act, which would uh, uh, make the cost of importing and exporting a lot cheaper. That's like uh, Singapore has open openness to trade. We have a very protected market because of the high cost of shipping through the Jones Act. 
uh, the high cost of taxation and government spending here, uh, the high degree of control over land use, the high degree of control over uh, transportation systems in the islands, uh, the high control and restriction on the, the importation of housing units for, for the islands. These are the five things that I would say are the biggest factors. If they, if they changed in a free market direction, we could have a, we could have a, an, a, a truly free market um, and very prosperous uh, 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 economy and society. Look at Hong Kong and Singapore in 50 years went from being the poorest countries in the world to being the richest. Hong Kong's even richer per capita than the United States, and Singapore is not far behind in terms of uh, wealth per person. And they did it because of economic freedom. And we could have that same kind of economic freedom and prosperity here as a result, which is practical, it's humane, and it's ethical. So we've really got to be a little more precise in our thinking when we say Hawaii should become more like Singapore. It's kind of like uh, a, a poor person saying, I see that rich person over there and who lives in that mansion drives a Cadillac. Therefore, I'm going to get a Cadillac, mm -hmm. which could be a disastrous economic proposition for a poor person to go out and try to acquire. Whereas on the other hand, if, if we looked at what caused the rich person to be rich mm -hmm. and said, I'm going to be like that, that would actually be helpful. So when we look at Singapore, let's not just look at the things that they spend money on, like public housing, and say, if we get public housing, we'll be like Singapore. Mm -hmm. When we look at Singapore, let's look at the reason they have the cash with which to have public housing, which is that they are economically free, mm -hmm. that they have uh, a, a robust free market economy. Mm -hmm. And let's admire that and go after that. Would you say that would be a better solution? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we have to look at not just um, uh, the, uh, the prosperity and wealth, but how they got there. And they got there because of economic freedom. I mean, uh, it, it may not be the, the political freedom that we would desire, but we would lose our political freedom as well the more and more we, we give up on our economic freedom, I believe. Those are good words to end on today. Our time has gone too quickly, but we would lose our other freedoms if we gave up on our economic freedom. Mm -hmm. Very well put, Ken. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you, it's a great pleasure. My guest today is Professor Ken Scoland of Hawaii Pacific University and also a scholar at the Grassroot Institute. You can access his work at grassrootinstitute.org. That's grassrootinstitute.org. Until next time on Hawaii Together, I'm Kili'i Akina on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.